one of the handicaps of being 5'6 is that a single heart cover book. <laughs> 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 Uh, I'm Russ Roberts. I am a uh, scholar at the Mercatus Center and a professor of economics here in the Department of Economics at George Mason. And I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of the Mercatus Center and the Social Change Project. Our speaker tonight is Deirdre McCluskey. Uh, I suspect I remember our first meeting much better than she does. I was a first year grad student at the University of Chicago and she was the director of graduate studies giving the orientation talk. So I was really a first week graduate student. It's 32 years ago, but I remember what she said pretty well. She said that economics was a powerful way of thinking about the world and that for some reason most of the profession was happy to leave that application of economics to the University of Chicago. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure things have improved over the last 30 years, but I like to think that at least the economic way of thinking has a vibrant home here at George Mason. Yes. Deirdre taught the first year graduate class uh, in price theory that I took. I had many fine teachers at Chicago, but Deirdre probably had the biggest influence on me. She certainly had the biggest impact on my teaching. Now, I see some of my students in the room, so you have Deirdre to blame or to thank, depending on your perspective. For over 30 years, I've taught a few thousand students price theory, and most of it is a version, a version of what she taught me, so my debt to her is a large one. And I like to think of it as borrowing, but it really was stealing, I guess, so I hope, I hope I'm forgiven. Uh, Deirdre's title is the Distinguished, she has many, but uh, her current one at the University of Illinois in Chicago is Distinguished Professor of Economics, History, English, and Communications, and I'm pretty sure she's the only professor at the university who counts all those subjects in her title, probably the only one in the country. Uh, her title gives you a hint of the breadth of her interests and scholarship that continued to educate me uh, as I have moved on, as she has as well. She has written 14 books, edited seven more, published some 360 articles on economic theory, economic history, philosophy, rhetoric, feminism, ethics, and law. She describes herself as a, quote, postmodern, free market, quantitative, Episcopalian, feminist, Aristotelian. <laughs> and I suspect her self-description is that short so it can fit on a business card. <laughs> her topic tonight is the treason of the clerisy, capitalism, and the intellectuals after 1848, based on her forthcoming book, Deirdre McCluskey. It's one of the pl 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 pleasures of, to, uh, 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 of teaching to grow old and have such um, students as Russ and, and Larry and others. You'll notice that I have a speech de defect. It's a free country. <laughs> you can run screaming from the room if you want, or you can learn to enjoy it as, as, as I have all these years. Um, I thank you very much for, for being here. I'm g g going to exploit you, I hope. I hope successfully. As, as, as an economist, I don't much believe in the notion of exploitation, but we're going to tr uh, try it out this evening. I'm in process of writing a, a series of books, Six for My Sins, which are meant to be a full-scale apology for capitalism. Now, as you can imagine, I'm not apologetic in the normal sense for capitalism. It's an apology in the theological sense, a justification of the way we live, of parts of the way we live. There are some of the parts of the way we live are bad and should be changed. But a, a, an, an explanation and, uh, and, um, um, and, and, and justification of the way we live aimed at people who believe that capitalism is bad. So if there are any people like that in this room, and I hope there are, these six books are aimed at you, and I hope you will rush down and, and put to, to, to rush down to your bookstore and, and put in early orders for all um, six books. 
The first one you can actually buy. It's called the Bourgeois Virtues Ethics for an Age of Commerce. It's available on cheap on Amazon.com. It was published by the University of Chicago. And the other books are, I, um, I hope, going to be published also by the University of Chicago. I, I'm, I'm hoping for a Harry Potter type boxed set <laughs> of six. A theologian wrote recently in, a, in the third volume of a trilogy of his. He said, I crammed all the last material into this final book. That's why it's so thick. Because though a trilogy might can be considered somewhat self-indulgent, a tetralogy is unforgivable. <laughs> well, I'm doing, God help me and you, a hexology. I guess that's what it's called. Six books. This first one asks the question, can you be an ethical person? Or theologically speaking, can you have a full spiritual life and yet be a capitalist? You know, I don't much like the word capitalism because as I explained um, in one of these numerous books, it's, it's misleading because it suggests that capital accumulation is the heart of how things have changed in the modern world. And I, I think the evidence is clear from economic historians and others that capital accumulation is not it. But of course I answer in this first book, yes. You can be a Christian, you can be a Muslim, you can be a, a serious ethical person and yet still be active in the, in, the, um, in the business world. Volume two, which I'm almost finished with, that's the one you ought to put your, your early orders in for, um, is, called, is, is called Bourgeois Deeds. How, how rhetoric made the modern world. The claim of that book is that the Industrial Revolution, the famous one you've heard of, um, this, this astonishing change that makes it possible for, look, us. I, I don't see any Habsburg noses here. I don't see any descendants of the crowned heads of Europe or of Asia or of Africa. I suppose everyone here pretty much came from peasant background, right? Am I right about that? You're, you're all descended from peasants, I, I know I am. Yet, here we are, leisured intellectuals, <laughs> discussing the pros and cons of capitalism of an evening. Now that change is gigantic. That change where you're permitted to have a full intellectual life denied to your great, 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 great uh, um, grandmother, who after all couldn't read, is the central puzzle of the social sciences. Not just economics, but all of the social sciences. How did we change from what we were in Europe in 1600, an undistinguished corner of the world, by comparison with China and India, a backwater, how did we become so rich? And then how did other people uh, pick up on this Northwestern European trick of economic growth and political uh, freedom combined? So, so the second book starts to inquire into this great, great uh, question. And the second book, this bourgeois deed stuff, the book, says, material explanations don't work. It's not the case that foreign trade or investment or the slave trade or imperialism or any of those things caused modern economic growth. Modern economic growth, I claim in the book, was caused by a change in the rhetoric about the economy. 
in earlier times and in other uh, places, and still in the minds of a great many people. People in the business world are held in contempt. In classical Confucianism, the merchant was the lowest of the social classes, below uh, peasants, which is quite surprising from a European point of view. But indeed, from a European point of view, the rich man finds it harder to get into heaven than a camel finds it to get through the eye of a needle. So there is contempt for the economic world right up through um, Shakespeare. Think of Shakespeare. Name the bourgeois hero in Shakespeare. None. All the heroes are aristocrats. Even in the one play that does deal with bourgeois life, namely The Merchant of Venice, Antonio, who is the Merchant of Venice of the play, is a lovelorn fool, right? He's not being admired for his business acumen, and, and business acumen is not praised in the play. Indeed, the most acumenist person in the play is Shylock, the, the, the outsider. So that's that book. Volume three is called, oh, what is it called? Um, they all have bourgeois in the title, so that helps me re re remember them. Um, oh yeah, uh, Bourgeois Towns, which is about the rise of prestige of the bourgeoisie. And that's part of my story this evening. In, in the 17th century in Holland, and the 18th century in England, the 19th century in France and Germany, and indeed, in the, let's go back to the 18th century, uh, practically from the foundation of the place in the, in the English colonies in North America, the prestige of the bourgeoisie increased. And my claim in volume two had been that what's necessary for modern economic growth, at least in those times, maybe it's not necessary now, although I think it is, is honoring of the bourgeoisie, of the middle class, right? Having respect for them, not placing them as in, in China, just above night soil men. You can kind of imagine what night soil men are. Um, uh, and allowing them to do their innovation, their buying low and selling high, that allows people to make deals. So my, my claim is, in this volume three, or my here, that's where I gather most of the evidence for the rise in the prestige through the 18th century up into the 19th of the middle class. Then volume four is called Bourgeois Words. And its claim is that indeed this was a change in rhetoric, a change in talk, and in this book, I'm going to, going to discuss how language matters in the economy. Why it matters that we're speaking animals. I mean, after all, in, in, in the economic theory that, that some of you have, have studied, there, there isn't any talk. Well, there, there's yes, no, and $3.50. That's the extent of conversation in conventional economics. You make offers, you accept them or not, that's all. Everything else, in the words of, uh, of certain game theorists, is called cheap talk. Me meaningless blabber. And I say no. I say that, that economies work on people's lips. That it's talk that matters for making an economy work. This is, a, this is an extension of Austrian economics. Austrian, I've, I've gradually, I'm, you know, I'm a, I started as a Marxist. I've, I've been a Keynesian. I've been everything, everything you want to name. I've been. I've, I've, uh, I, then I became a uh, Samuelsonian engineering type economist. Then I became a Chicago school economist. Then I, then I'm gradually drifting into Austrian economics. I'm fond of saying I'm as, as Mae West did. 
Mae West, the great American comedian. I was snow white, but I drifted. <laughs> <laughs> then, volume, volumes two, three, four, have solved the problem of the Industrial Revolution. You want to know what caused the modern world? Come see me, buy my books. <laughs> solved. <laughs> Volume, uh, let's see, we're how far are we? Five, thank you, thank you. Five is what, what I mainly want, to, want you to help me think about this evening. And this is called Bourgeois Enemies. And it can have various subtitles, such as how the clerisy, as I call it, the artists and the intellectuals, turned against capitalism after 1848. One can be somewhat precise about that, because 1848 was a, was, a, was a salient year. A lot of things were going on in 1848. Karl Marx was going on in 1848, for example. Um, so, and then volume six is, as you can imagine, somewhat vague in my head, it's the economics. It's when I finally put back on my hat as an economist and stop pretending to be an intellectual historian or a social historian or a, or a literary historian. Say, okay, okay, I'm all through with that, or a sociologist, now I'm gonna be an economist again. And I go through the economic criticisms that arise in the minds of doubters about capitalism. What about the business cycle? We're talking about it right now, aren't we? The subprime mortgage crisis and the, and the collapse of the economy. This has brought up all our anxieties about the uh, sort of occasional nervous collapse that capitalism keeps having. It goes like this, watch. Goes, you know, goes up and this has been happening for two and a half centuries now, so we, we ought to be accustomed to it by now. It goes up and then it collapses, goes up and then it collapses, goes up and collapses. And this has happened about 20 or 30 times, but it keeps going up. So uh, if you want to take away from this talk, don't worry, it's going to go up again. <laughs> the, the, the sky is not falling, the world is not coming to an end, it's not the Great Depression. Don't worry, kids, it's going to be all right. Aunt Deirdre assures you. <laughs> there is, with, that with that, there is a money-back guarantee. All right, <coughs> now to volume five, this volume five, Bourgeois Enemies. And it's a sad story in this book. It's, it's the story of how in the late 18th century in the West, we were developing a new ideology of a free society. An ideology in favor of innovation, an ideology in favor of allowing people to make deals with each other, um, and that was very unusual. It was not the, the although it was often the way of actually organizing societies, this is kind of a paradox, it was not the way that people talked about societies. The standard way of talking about society, say in Shakespeare's time, was what was known at the time as the great chain of being. You know, from God to the dog, right? The great chain of being through the, through the princes and dukes and marquises and barons and knights and, and uh, merchants and, and per proletariat, uh, they weren't called that, but blah, blah, down to women, way at the bottom, except for Queen Elizabeth, um, who had, though she had the body of a weak a woman, she had the heart and stomach of a king and a king of England, too. And down and down to the dog. Dog, by the way, this is, this is another, another handy takeaway. Dog is God spelled backwards. <laughs> Bear that in mind. That's an important fact about dogs. I, I love dogs. Dog is, is God spelled backwards. Now, 
What was developing in the late 18th century and in the, in the very early 19th in France and England and the United States, I say, was a, you could call it in crude terms, a pro-capitalist ideology. Everyone liked the bourgeoisie and the market <coughs> in those days. Well, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but, but surprising by modern standards, quite surprising people were in favor of markets. Alessandro Manzoni, the, the Italian Tolstoy, who wrote um, I Promessi uh, Sposi, the great, the great novel of Italian literature, the, the betrothed, it means in English. Uh, the last uh, edition of his book was 1840. He was an Italian nationalist, and he was also a liberal in the 19th century sense. That is, he's in favor of free societies. And in particular, he was in favor of markets and capitalism. Chapter 11, I think it is, I may be wrong, but I think it's chapter 11 of I Permessi Sposi. You could assign in your Ec 1 course as showing why it's bad to have price controls during a famine. He said, no, let it rip. Supply and demand, the price will take care of things. Even in a famine, no price controls, that's a disaster. And he's just one of a great number of examples of this very sweet situation <laughs> where the artists and the intellectuals were essentially in favor of the economic um, system, and most particularly the economic ideology that was emerging, the economic uh, rhetoric that was, was emerging. Now, um, Adam Smith, for example, is the great theorist of, of, of uh, capitalism, of course. And Adam Smith, contrary to what you might have heard in the movies or something, Adam Smith was an ethical philosopher. In fact, his only academic job was professor of moral philosophy. And he took it very seriously. And he believed that there were five virtues, count them, prudence, temperance, justice. Those were the three main ones. Prudence, temperance, justice. Prudence is rationality, maximization, know-how, savoir-faire, Knowing how to take care of yourself, that's prudence. It's what we try to teach our dogs and children. Um, um, temperance is self-control, control over the will. Um, and, 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 and justice is the social analog to control over your own emotions. It's, it's social balance the way that temperance is individual balance inside your own, own soul. And then to those three, he added love and courage. So he had five virtues. And he believed that a market society worked within these five virtues. Now, actually, courage and love were kind of off to the side of Adam Smith's concern. And what was very much off to the side were the so-called theological virtues. Faith, hope, and transcendent love, and the greatest of these is love. These he wanted to keep off stage, because in common with lots of 18th century philosophers, he was in, uh, from, uh, starting with, a, a, with, a, with a, a, a 17th century philosopher, Hobbes, and even as early as Descartes, he was in the project of trying to do philosophy, ethical philosophy, and social philosophy in this case, without God. Before, this, before the late 17th century, or middle in the case of Hobbes, it was inconceivable, except in kind of crazy people like, like, like Machiavelli, to think of social theory, and certainly to think of ethical behavior without talking about theology about God's purposes for us on earth. But it was the common project of the Enlightenment, both in Scotland and in France, 
to do without God, to do without the hypothesis of God, as it was famously put. Now, just as this theory, this rather rich theory that Adam Smith was developing, and then, then was developed by other people, Jean-Baptiste Jean uh, Say, and lots of other people. <coughs> Pardon me, I, I'm, I'm recovering from pneumonia. I learned the Monday before last that I had pneumonia. I had, I had, <coughs> I had it for two weeks before I even knew it. The rule is, a fever for three days, you go to the doctor. Have you all got that? <laughs> if you have a fever for more than three days, it's probably pneumonia. And it's very easy to fix. Go, go do it. All right. Um, this, this, how can I say, this unified sensibility, put it that way. This feeling that we were in a market society, an innovative, growing society, an economy, the economy was paying us back. It was a good thing to allow people to make deals. We shouldn't over-regulate. We shouldn't seize the means of production. Uh, property was good. All this kind of unified sensibility between artists and intellectuals on the one hand and the society on the other started to break up just as it formed. <laughs> two, two examples. Utilitarianism, the most extreme form de developed by G G Jeremy uh, Bentham, who thought that, that poetry could, could, was, no, was not superior to a children's game called Pushpin. He couldn't see the see the difference. It was famously said of Bentham that he only knew that something was poetry because it, the lines weren't right justified on the page. <laughs> Otherwise, he couldn't tell whether it was poetry or prose. This man said, uh, taking a suggestion from David Hume, carry it very far, that all the virtues could be crammed into the virtue of prudence. In, in economics, we call it max u. You've heard of max u if you've, if you've studied economics. Maximize utility. Heard that phrase? Maximize utility. Max u is the person who does the maximization. He's a, he's a sociopath. <laughs> he's, a, he's a maximizer. And that's what he does, dear. He's not interested in you for your sake. He's interested in you because it gives him pleasure to be interested in you. He's a very self-centered guy. And Jeremy Bentham said, this is how society works. And that, although it's the core of modern economics, what modern economics can be called Samuelsonian economics, after Paul, uh, 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 Samuelson, my mom's tennis partner. <laughs> I'm not making that up. Paul Samuelson, the great economist, was my mom's uh, um, doubles partner. Um, <laughs> crazy fact. More takeaways. Um, uh, he, he said that Max Hugh is enough to explain society. And certainly it's enough to explain the economy. And that breaks down the unified ethical view that a person like Adam Smith took of the place of the economy in the social world. In Adam Smith's view, um, the economy was not, was not something separate from your ethical or social behavior. Whereas in the Max Hu world, Max Hu, as I said, is only thinking of himself. He doesn't care about, about love or faith or hope or temperance or anything. He just cares about prudence. That's one of the fragmentations of this temporary unity. Another very important one is U European romanticism which elevates the virtue of courage and love 
and perhaps hope and faith too, to, to the height. And, ro ro and romanticism, German ro romanticism, develops into a, um, a conservative, anti-utilitarian style of argument. Um, uh, your your co colleague here at GMU, uh, uh, um, David, uh, David, uh, David, uh, David, uh, David, see, I do stuff. David, David, David Levy has done very interesting work on the the conservative anti-utilitarians in the middle of the 19th century, like uh, 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 um, Thomas. Um, Carlyle. Romanticism, as the great intellectual historian and philosopher <coughs> Isaiah Berlin said, was one of the three hinges in the history of Western civilization. We are still in the Romantic Age. Before 1800, artists didn't think of themselves as inspired, for example. They thought of themselves as craftsmen. Indeed, they thought of themselves as businessmen, and women, the few there were. They were very businesslike about it all. Bach was, Handel was, Mozart was. They were not romantic, you know? But then the artist became a romantic hero, and the politician imitated the artist. So, so you get a strange form of romanticized um, politics that comes to its climax in fascism. Another aspect, I'm, 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 I'm just sketching, I'm just making a few suggestions of what's a large event. Um, another aspect of this is the separation of spheres between men and women. The, the, the bourgeois family in the early 19th century learns to think of the world, or think of, of the virtues, as split between men and women. Men go out into the world, that is the middle class man goes out into the business world, and deals in prudence and courage and hope. He's an entrepreneur, he has to have hope, He's, he's a businessman at all, he's got to have courage because he may go bankrupt uh, tomorrow. He has to, has to control his fear and he's prudent because that's the chief virtue of, of the business world. Just as love, or trans <laughs> transcendent love, is the chief virtue of the saint and physical courage is the chief virtue of the hero, prudence is the chief virtue of the, of the business person. Whereas all the other virtues are handed over to the so-called angel in the house. The middle class housewife. Now a housewife no longer helping in the business which has been separated physically from the home for the first time uh, in the late 18th, early 19th century. So she does temperance, justice, <laughs> Um, human love, transcendent love, faith. She does all those. So it was breaking apart in the early 19th century. And then it really broke apart. That is, the approval by the artists and intellectuals of capitalism ended rather suddenly in 1848. As George Bernard Shaw uh, um, put it in 1910, look, looking back, he, he spoke of the Great Conversion. The first half of the 19th century, he said, despised and pitied the Middle Ages. We were modern. We didn't need any of those Middle Ages. The second half, by contrast, saw no hope for mankind <coughs> except in the recovery of the faith, the art, and the humanities of 
the Middle Ages. For that was how men felt and how some of them spoke in the early days of the Great Conversion, which produced first such books as Latter-day uh, Pamphlets by Carlyle, Hard Times by Charles, um, Charles Dickens, 1854, and later on, the Socialist Movement. So the consequence of this sad disintegration of the ideology of capitalism were the great, the two great, well, three actually, but two great and third supplementary ideas of the 19th century. Catastrophic ideas, because there were lots of ideas of the 19th century that was good. These were the bad ones, the three baddies. The first one was nationalism, which you can think of as a recovery of the virtue of faith. Faith is not just about God. Faith is about identity and identity politics. I am French. I am German. Came to theoretical perfection in the 19th century and then practical perfection, alas, in, in the 20th century. And then socialism, which itself has some of its roots in evangelical Christianity and indeed in mainstream um, Anglican or, or Lutheran um, uh, um, Christianity. Socialism was the other invention of the 19th century, the other big, bad political invention. And the consequences of these two were 1914 for nationalism and 1917 for, for socialism. The two worst dates in, in modern European history, August 1914, October 1917. The result of nationalism, the result of large national armies um, is August 1914. The result of the, of the theorizing and, and, and agitating about, 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 about socialism in the 19th century is the, is the, is the Bolshevik uh, revolution. Think about these two just a tiny bit more. Again, I'm just scratching the surface here. We, we'll, we'll, we, we, we'll talk in a few minutes, and you'll help me th think about this sad story. Um, nationalism, for instance, comes out in Hellenism. You know, this, the 19th century, is the, is, it's been commonly said, is the age of ism, ismus. Hellenism, namely the conviction that young men should be taught Greek, not just Latin, is the, was taught in a way that the central experience was to read the Iliad in Greek. In the opening scenes of the American version of All Quiet on the Western Front, 1930, I believe it is, the, um, the, the, the high school teacher, the professor, is urging his boys to go off and volunteer in August 1914 to fight for the, for the German uh, folk in the state. And in the back, in that first scene, is Greek uh, on the blackboard. And it's the opening lines of the Iliad. Thus the wrath of, uh, thus the wrath of uh, Achilles. The idea was, and it's not, it's not in anyone's, I, I'm not sure there's, there's much explicit talk about this, but this is how I interpret it. 
The idea was to create a new aristocracy out of the sons of the bourgeoisie. Because in order to run a mass army, you need hundreds of thousands of officers. And officers, the way you, European armies were organized, had to be gentlemen, had to be pseudo-aristocrats. Thus, in the universities in Germany, there were dueling fraternities. You've seen, you perhaps you've seen photographs of these guys with masks on their face that kind of kind of cover their eyes. I think they even had glass things for their eyes, but they had open areas for their cheeks. So like the African uh, uh, warriors, they could have honorable, I was a, I was a fencer in college, so I could do it. They, they, they could do the honorable scars of, uh, of the saber. Now, who were these boys? Were they, you know, sons of the Junkers of East Germany, of, the, uh, of Prussia? No, they weren't. They were the sons of shopkeepers. They were bourgeois. They were being made into aristocrats. A very interesting example of this is the great economic historian and sociologist and economist, Max Weber, a professor who fought duels all his life, uh, which, which is a little hard for us at George Mason or the University of Illinois at Chicago to conceive. That, um, uh, that so, uh, um, socialism, as I say, had a strain that came out of, uh, out of Christianity. But there's a third one I mentioned, and here I'm going to end. The, the third one I, I have in mind, the third ism, the third evil ism, and you, you, you should hear, this is a, th a movie theater, you should hear the scary music <coughs> as I talk about nationalism. <coughs> and socialism, and the third one, scientism. <laughs> scientism, think of the scary music. Um, I'm not too good at doing scary music right now. The clerisy, the artists and intellectuals, supported these projects of nationalism and socialism with science. Or if you want, you know, this this irritating thing that people do. You can put quote marks around the science. Nationalism, for example, as you know, was supported by racism, by the notion that Europeans were superior to everyone, and some Europeans were superior to other Europeans, and at the top were people from Southeast England. Right? Well, it sounds silly now, but in 1910, most intellectuals believed it was true. And they not only believed it was true, it wasn't just their opinion that it was true, they thought they had scientific evidence that it was true. So nationalism, the dividing up of people into, into nations and thinking of them having histories of their own, and therefore it is the, it is the, uh, uh, the, the fate of the Slavic nations to be slaves to the Germans, say. Uh, it's just their fate because, sorry, that's your nation. You're stuck with it, that's your nation. And that we have scientific evidence for that. The same with um, uh, um, socialism. It, Marx and Engels call their, their socialism scientific materialism. And they weren't just using words casually. They, they thought of what they did as science. They thought that science told us that socialism was the future of society, not free market of capitalism. So there's a kind of a sin of pride that my, my, my fellow intellectuals and artists, I'm not an artist, but I am an intellectual, in, indulge him that was a very evil accompaniment. Think of it as uh, Merlin the Magician. 
accompanying these, these, um, these fools off on the errands of nationalism and socialism. And each of them had its, its uh, this is actually the, the, the an analysis of, of the great um, Italian Marxist uh, Gramsci. He said that every social formation creates its own intellectuals. And that's what I'm saying here. These evil results of the breakdown of the consensus about capitalism after 1848, namely nationalism and socialism, each had their own science, scientific justifications. So that's my story. It's, a, it's, 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 it's fairly conventional. There isn't anything particularly shocking in, in what I'm saying here. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's the story of, well, here's one thing that's shocking about it. <laughs> I am saying that ideas matter. You'll notice that I'm not a materialist on these matters. And if you, if you remember what I said about my other books, you'll notice they too talk a lot about ideas and rhetoric and how people talk to each other, right? And I think that's very, very important in history. For a long time in the intellectual life of the West, from say 1890 to 1980, everyone was a materialist. Everyone was a vulgar Marxist, essentially. Everyone believed that, pardon me, good Lord, I can't blame that on anything. Um, <laughs> um, uh, everyone believed that ideas were you know, the result of your class position. Ah, comrade, it is no accident that you think thus and such. Of course, your object, I was, I was once a communist, so I can do it. Um, uh, it is no accident, your objective position, should, that's where your ideas come from. And that's, a, that's a standard trope, it's a standard figure of speech for about 90 years in the West. There's been a revival of intellectual history since then, and I'm a minor follower of this. Um, but, you know, I want you to understand, I'm not an idealist, and I am an idealist now, on metaphysical grounds. I'm a disappointed materialist. <laughs> See, I once thought that economics did it all, that economic forces explained everything, including ideas, and that that just had to be how it was, because what else is scientific? Otherwise, it's just nonsense. Now I'm a professor of English. How low can you sink? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's my, that's my story. That's my, that's my, that's my project. The, the, the whole thing, the box set, which will sell, if it sells one hundredth what the Harry Potter books do, <laughs> I will retire in splendor to my loft in Chicago and drink um, um, Chinsano for the rest of my life. Um, but the whole is going to be called the bourgeois era, because we are bourgeois. Everyone in this room, regardless of origin, whether working class origin or not, you are, by virtue of your educations, middle class. My advice is to get used to it, um, to, to not be ashamed of being middle class. I, one, one, one purpose of this set of books is to try to revive, indeed, the very word bourgeois, but, but even the concept that being middle class is not itself sinful. Being a business person or being a, 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 you know, a person useful to a commercial society is not a bad thing. It's not complete. You must attend to your spiritual life and to, you know, the, as I explained to my undergraduates, I, don't, I think most of them don't quite understand it, I say, the purpose of life is not to die with the most automobiles. And they, they don't quite. But why not? God, it'd be great to have a BMW, two of them. And, 
I said, no, dear. At age 40 or so, you'll see that that's not the purpose of life. So it's not sufficient to buy low and sell high for to be a full human being. I, I suppose there, there to, 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 to express it one way, I want there to be a humanistic science of economics. I don't want to abandon the mathematics, which I like very much. I, I don't want to um, not do experiments or not measure stuff. But I want us to think of economics, as Adam Smith did, in its full rhetorical and ethical context. And that's what I'm trying to do in these books and a number of other people, including Russ here, are, are, are trying to do. Um, the other point, there was, there was another final point I was going to make, but I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ivan Boski, a very successful trader of some sort. I, I forget what it is he traded. In the 80s very popular guy, was chosen by the students to, of Berkeley, the University of California at Berkeley, to address them for their, their commencement. They chose him. And he came and he spoke and he said, kids, what is it, 1983, something like that, kids, I want you to know one thing, greed is good. And all the kids said, yay, greed is good. I can, I can go after my, the, the, my what were they called, uh, BMWs. Uh, two years later, he went to jail. <laughs> Shortly after that, the movie Wall Street. How many people have seen the movie Wall Street? Yeah, yeah, lots of you have seen it. That's an anti-capitalist film. And the main uh, character, um, uses the, 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 the Boski line. Greed is good. Ayn Rand said the same thing. And it's nonsense, kids. <laughs> As uh, who is it, there's this, this wonderful American comedian, I think he just died. He says, it's bullshit and it's bad for you. What's his name? Carlin. Yeah, yeah, George Carlin. Saying that greed is good is bullshit and it's bad for you. <laughs> and if you wanted to summarize my entire project, starting with this book, it would be to say that greed is a sin. Prudence is a virtue. But prudence has to be balanced with the other virtues to be a virtue. Prudence all by itself is called greed, and it's a sin. So go forth and sin no more. <laughs> <laughs>